Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 328, the Consecration Edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Gavin Ashenden, and the 28th of September, 2017. Okay, Gavin, you know, often when we do a show, we get email responses and, you know, sometimes we say something weird and it's misinterpreted or interpreted correctly by our audience and they call us on it, which is what they're supposed to do. Uh, We like feedback. We want to know that people are listening and watching the show and your comments prove that you are and we thank you for that. And sometimes... uh, I, I really want to impose upon the listener and the viewer that this is unscripted. We we barely know what we're going to talk about before we talk about it. Uh, basically, oh, that's so true. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when we started to talk about a little bit about Roman Catholic dogma the other day. Uh, I just sprung on on Gavin. He goes, hey, do you want to talk about marriage, remarriage in the church? Oh, sure, we'll do it. Okay, no problem, Kevin. won't be a problem at all. And it was a little problem because... All you have to do, and in Anglicanism, there's a bit of forgiveness. Uh, in Roman Catholicism, especially around marriage or remarriage, if you, if you kind of screw those words up, it's all over. And uh, Gavin, you screwed those words up. Oh, Kevin, I did. I got such lovely emails. It was the capital letters that really, that really cheered me up. You misspoke capital letters, exclamation marks. All I could say was, I'm really sorry. I did. I can't think how I was so stupid. But, you know, as you say, this is unscripted and uh, our, our, my shallowness is exposed all too often. And what had happened was I was talking in my mind about Roman Catholics who had been divorced and remarried. Mm-hmm. And I forgot to say and remarried. So I said, I I misspoke. I didn't tell the truth. I misled people when I said that that Roman Catholics who had been divorced were excommunicated. Of course they're not, only if they remarry. And then, and this is where it gets uh, even more colorful, and I'm glad we didn't talk about it. No. (laughs) Only then if they resume full marital relationships instead of living as a brother and sister. If they were to live as a brother and sister, they wouldn't be excommunicated. So um, I apologize for not making that clear and not not matching up the words in my mouth with the thoughts in my head. All right. Well, I think you made uh, Pope Francis happy. Um, <laughs> I, I was going to read his email on the air, but I don't have to now. <laughs> <laughs> I have a nice picture of him whispering nice things in my ear, which I can send you. <laughs> So, uh, on to the oh, show. Oh, you think I'm joking? No, I'm I, I, I've seen the picture. I thought, <laughs> yeah, yes. you, you have met Pope Francis. Yes, yes. We, we, uh, uh, we, 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 he asked me to pray for him, and we had a few words together on the podium in the middle of, of, uh, of um, St. Peter's Square. It was, a, it was a funny little miracle. Actually, it's not at all uh, unconnected with, um, with what we're talking about, but, mm-hmm. but this is a different story. Sure. Well, it's I, I have. There's a picture of me with the Pope as well. Uh, I was at a Philadelphia train station, and there was a cardboard cutout of <laughs> the, the Pontiff. And I said, "This is the only chance I'm going to get to have a picture with the Pope." And it, it'll never be published because, for some reason, my hair that day was just and <laughs> just what it is. It is what it is. So on to other news. I don't know. It's kind of a boring week. Um, oh wait. Oh, hold on. You're wearing the wrong color shirt. I'm going to have to adjust that color. Um, in case people, I don't think anybody who who's out there doesn't know um, that uh, you were recently uh, uh, honored with the con- to be consecrated a bishop. Yes, Kevin, uh, and um, I've had emails about that as well. Ninety nine percent of them have been really lovely. But but one percent of them have said you are an ambitious, conceited, and 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 a few other words, um, and uh, uh, I, I wanted to write back saying how how do you know this? Um, I have many sins, uh, 
Am ambition isn't one of them anymore and any conceit my wife deals with instantly so <laughs> the scope for that is limited to some extent um kevin what this is something that uh, has come into the news recently but has been uh, in the background for a while because uh, it's become clear over the recent while that um the Church of England wasn't going to be very generous in the way it offered Episcopal care to, to traditionalists. So I, I expect uh, our listeners know that there's really quite a large conservative evangelical constituency in the Church of England. It's vibrant, it believes in the Bible, it's growing. Uh, and um, it, it was offered one bishop, uh, a kind of flying bishop, a guy called Rod Thomas, who was chairman of Reform, which is... Uh, one particular conservative group in the church. Now, in, in terms of statistics, the idea that something like 20% of the Church of England could be covered by one bishop was silly. So for a long time now, people have been saying to the, uh, the Church of England, you must provide more bishops for people who don't accept your progressive gender theology. And at the other end, the, at the sacramental end, the Anglo-Catholic end, uh, the deal there is a very precarious one. Uh, it was forged in about 2013, but essentially what was really needed was a third province. And with a third province, with archbishops and bishops who were, uh, if you like, in a safe theological and ecclesial space, then this witness, this part of the Church of England, would have been safe. But whatever the reasons were, this wasn't achieved. Um, and instead, what we have is a kind of a relationship of trust now, the problem with this relationship of trust is, as we discussed a few weeks ago with the Philip North affair, is that trust only works for as long as you can trust people. Mm -hmm. And once the trust goes, then everything built upon it goes too. And, and in fact, the, the Philip North debacle, uh, I think, is an example of the fact that the promises made or the promises intended or the aspirations intended uh, can't and, and won't be delivered. So one of one of the things that's been happening is across the Anglican world, um, different Anglican groups have been looking at the situation in England and saying, what can we do to help? Uh, and GAFCON looked and it said, well, we need somebody who can speak for GAFCON and we'll, we'll offer Andy Lyons. And so they consecrated Andy Lyons. And I think that was a great thing to do. Mm -hmm. It was overdue. Uh, they chose a great guy. It was well done. But um, it's only part of the Anglican spectrum, and there's another part. Uh, I, I don't really use labels because I don't think they're very helpful. I mean, if anyone wanted to ask me, I would say, well, I identify with first millennium Christianity. Uh, I've never heard but... that one before. That's not <laughs> Is that I the fourth stream one. or something? First millennium. All right, okay. Stream number well, four. <laughs> um, but but there's, but there's a kind of, there's a sacramental Anglicanism uh, and without wanting to criticize forward in faith or the society in in England, because it's full of some very good people, if I just say that there are problems there that have yet to be ironed out properly, uh, and that this have given concern to sacramental Anglicans in the rest of the world. So I was approached and they said, look, uh, we think that the, the, Church of, the Church of England or Anglicans in England need some Orthodox bishops. And this particular group that approached me uh, called the Christian Episcopal Church, um, had orders with uh, an element of Roman Catholic um, uh, connection in them. Uh, there was a guy called Duarte Costa who was a Roman Catholic bishop in Brazil. He was quite a character. He took the Vatican on over Nazism in South America in the late 40s. Uh, and he was. Um, they persuaded his secretary to slip his resignation papers in his morning mail. And he found that at 11 o'clock, he was still bishop. And at five past when he'd signed all his papers, he wasn't bishop anymore. Oh, and <laughs> he, he, however, he was a great, he was a very interesting uh, uh, and prophetic man. But later on, he took part in some consecrations for Anglican bishops. And in particular, there was an Anglican bishop called Donald A. Davis, who was, uh, who was bishop of Fort Worth in the 1980s. Uh, and so Donald A. Davis had, had Catholic orders, valid but irregular, as they say. Uh, and he left, he, he led an exodus out of tech uh, really quite early on. 
and developed, I think, something called the Christian Missionary Church, which became the Christian Episcopal Church. Uh, it was really quite large and dynamic. They had some problems. Somebody embezzled a lot of money uh, and um, there were some crises. And so it's a small group now, but, but the people I met, the bishops in it, struck me as having a caliber of Christianity that I had rarely met. I really liked them. Uh, they really liked me. I, I liked their orders. Uh, I, I like their authenticity and they say, we we want you to help Anglicans in England, will you do it? Um, originally, Kevin, I said, certainly not. I have a public reputation which I don't want to lose. <laughs> um, I have to say, I hope, I hope she doesn't see this, but um, my wife got in on the conversation and she said, this is clearly something that God wants to happen and you are refusing to do it because you're concerned about your public reputation. Is that right? I said, yes, that, that's exactly right. <laughs> and so she, so she, she invited me to rethink. Um, I, I realized that I would come in for some misunderstanding, some criticism, uh, but, but actually I agreed with the project. Um, it is quite clear already that within England, one of the strategies of the establishment is to diminish the number of Orthodox bishops that Anglican clergy and people can turn to. So one way or another, there need to be more Orthodox bishops to offer some kind of oversight. Now, how that will work out, nobody really knows. Uh, but I decided that, that I would say yes. And so, uh, so that's what's happened. Early in my travels, I was speaking with a uh, Global South bishop, um, Archbishop. Archbishop at the time, and uh, this is probably 2008, 2009, and we were talking about the problem with the Anglican Communion, and I'm talking about tech. They're the problem. He says, no, Kevin, tech is kind of, you know, a symptom of the problem. The problem is the Church of England. Mm. What are you talking? No, you, and I didn't want to correct him, obviously, because that would be silly, and I, that always stuck in my mind that, okay, the problem is the Church of England. And we talked a little bit more about the solution. He says, you know, you need to drop 10, 15 bishops in there and, and start over. And Do you know, that, that's really interesting to hear that. And I'm quite encouraging to you. So go on. Yeah. yeah. And so I kind of put that in the back of my mind as, you know, obviously, you know, the Global South doesn't get it. They don't understand what they're talking about. But as time goes on, it makes a lot more sense uh, that, you know, the solution for the Church of England is to pour a bunch of uh, Orthodox, for lack, first millennial uh, <clears throat> Christians uh, who are wearing purple into uh, Europe and in the Church of England and, and do a reboot. And, uh, well, you know, we'll have to see what happens. Now, I get a lot of email, too, when things happen on Anglican Unscripted. And so I have to read you some of those. Um, uh, Pope Francis says, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <Wrong one. laughs> so here's what I got this morning so just a quick question Kevin should I be happy about the news about Gavin or not uh, I was taken aback by it I'm happy for him personally I guess I like him but I'm sort of not happy because it's with other breakaway groups uh, that seem to be just a bunch of splintering bishops trying to do the same thing as the ACNA GAFCON and all the others. Um, should this viewer be happy? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh -huh. uh, so one of the things that, that we can do in England is we can look at what happened in the States. And, and your question is exactly right. We know that the Orthodox uh, had this kind of centrifugal splintering. Um, and uh, so one of the things we said to ourselves is, we mustn't let that happen here. Now, my, my fear is it might well happen because it's human nature. Um, and we're in a spiritual conflict. But, but um, one of the things that we have here is something called a unity forum. And the unity forum comprises of groups of Anglicans from different spiritualities. And the intention is to draw everyone together. Mm -hmm. Now, to do that, the bishops who are involved are going to have to love each other, um, pray for each other, commit to each other, um, and, uh, and offer a spectrum of Episcopal care across Anglican spirituality. Now, in theory, it can be done, but, but absolutely, if this was an attempt to start a new church with new congregations and drawing people into, into kind of fresh schism, that would be a, a seriously bad thing to do. What is much more addressed at is the fact that um, 
I personally don't think that people should leave the Church of England. This is not a tech ACNA replay. A lot of people look at what's going on with us as if it were. But, but here's what I think is going to happen. The Church of England is, is likely to go bankrupt, a, a lot of it, most of it. Uh, within you're, five... you're not talking just spiritually, are you? No, no, uh, okay. I'm talking financially. Okay, all right. <laughs> so within the next five to seven years, many dioceses will be close to bankrupt or, or, or insolvent. Uh, they don't have the money, they don't have the people. The average age is about 65, uh, and the, um, the demographics are, are, are dropping really very quickly. Now, there is money in the church. There's historic money. There's property, for example. The church commissioners are very rich indeed, but they are bound by trust law as to what they can spend their money on. So if the Archbishop of Canterbury asks them for several million pounds for a project, they have it and they'll give it to him. But if a diocesan bishop says, look, I have, um, I have 50 churches, parishes I want to keep going. Can I have some money to do that? The answer is no, you can't. So one of the things that will happen is that is that the parishes will fail in dioceses and what we hope what we what we think ought to happen is that that clergy who are in parishes at the moment and they have very strong legal rights under what's called freehold here um, should stay in position and then in five to seven years uh, say to the church of england we would like to rent this church uh, we want we want for example to do a kind of dual denomination thing uh, we will continue to be church of england and uh, all that you need to legally do i think is to say a, a morning prayer in the church on saturday on sunday morning at eight o'clock to satisfy the minimal canonical requirements but actually we're also going to have a relationship with uh with another group of anglicans um and so by by having if for example you're a, you're a, a priest in a congregation and let us say that your bishop is a woman, which you don't agree with, uh, and therefore that you really have no bishop as such. Uh, let's say that that, that woman has uh, invited uh, Muslims to practice the call of prayer in her cathedral precincts. And you say, I really don't have a bishop <laughs> as such, but you're, but you're an Anglican. Where would, you, where would you go for orthodox Episcopal oversight? Well, you couldn't have it legally, but you could have it spiritually. And what we think ought to happen is that there ought to be, as your Archbishop from the Global South said, a number of Anglican bishops committed to unity, committed to evangelism, uh, who are willing to offer Episcopal oversight as the number of bishops who are appointed in the Church of England who are heterodox grows, and it grows by the month. Uh, and so uh, who is to offer Episcopal care to these people? That's, it's the intention to make that kind of provision. But, but the intention is unity, are drawing together, not not creating a separate empires and splitting people apart. So if we can do it, I hope that ought to satisfy your question and is perfectly a proper question. Mm -hmm. it, it is. Um, now, here in the USA, we, we tried to negotiate with the Episcopal Church and uh, try to retain our properties and stuff like that. Um, the presiding bishop at the time had other thoughts on the issue and, and thought that legal recourse was uh, a better result for her. Um, what are the legalities, and we're running up here on time, what are the legalities mm -hmm. in a place like the Church of England? Uh, can they refuse the, the right of rental? Uh, but, well, the legalities are quite they, they complex. Well, yeah, but they won't refuse it to the Muslims. They won't refu refuse it to the B <laughs> Buddhist. But <laughs> can they re refuse it to you know uh, competing Anglican uh, entities? Um, certainly, if a church, if so, we've got two kinds of churches we need to distinguish. Mm -hmm. um, those that have been deconsecrated and are right. just buildings which can be sold or rented to whoever you like, and then they can sell them or rent them to whoever you like. Okay. Um, and and indeed, there are a number of churches in almost every diocese, rural dioceses, which are up now for for sale and for sale in particular. But but we're thinking more of congregations where they're in their church already. But, and they don't want to move out of their church, they don't want to give it up, but nor do they want disciplinary action brought against them. For example, if they invited in a bishop um, who, did not, who was not licensed by the archbishop or the diocesan bishop to preach, they would be committing a disciplinary offence. Well, now, let's say they wanted to have oversight from such a bishop, hypothetically speaking. <laughs> um, what they might end up by doing is saying to the diocese, look, 
we'd like you to, to, to rent us the building that we have legal rights to anyway, so that we can uh, have a different ecclesial persona, a kind of dual passport at the same time. Now, initially, the diocese would say, certainly not. Do you think we're crazy? Why should we do that? But if the diocese was very short of money uh, and, and really very badly needed the money, then there might be room for negotiation. So um, we just have to wait and see. No one really knows what's going to happen in England. Uh, no one knows how much of the Anglican Church here can be saved or even wants to be saved. Uh, so, but, but to do nothing is probably not the right way forward. No. Well, let's be clear that you're not likely to uh, get permission from the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, this one or future ones, to uh, perform Eucharist or uh, bishop functions in churches. So anybody who invited, I, I didn't. What's that? I didn't think I'd embarrass. I didn't think I'd embarrass him or me by asking him, Kevin. No. If he's watching, Justin, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, going to... <laughs> we're good. <laughs> um, and as such, if you did go to a church, you kind of have to meet in the parish hall uh, yeah. and stuff like that to avoid the church being disciplined uh, or yourself yes. ending up tarred or feathered. Um, or you'd have to, or, or you'd have to give a talk, but not a sermon, or uh, be interviewed. Sure. Okay. I mean, the, uh, evangelicals in the Church of England have done this for a very long time. They've uh, they, they've nuanced what is a sermon and what isn't a sermon to the nth degree. But on the other hand, really, one doesn't want to be playing these kind of games. They're not dignified and they're not terribly honest. So you're right; it can be done in a church hall or done outside a formal service, or or it could be done inside the liturgy of a of a, of a different Anglican denomination. In theory, mm -hmm. there are ways of doing it. But um, uh, so we we're looking to find a way forward. But what we have to do is to is to provide uh, Episcopal oversight for faithful Christians so that their communities can remain Anglican and Episcopalian and flourish. It's the flourishing of the kingdom and the gospel and Christian communities that, that we have to work towards. Find some way of doing it. Okay. Next email. And this we're done after this one. Right. All right. Here, here's an email. And this is one of about 45 Congratulations to Gavin. Please tell me he's not leaving the show. <laughs> okay. okay. Nothing about Kevin. They don't care about me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Kevin, you, you can't sack yourself. That's, yeah, that's right. They know you can't. <laughs> they know you're safe in the seat. It's all right. And like, I probably have to talk to the board of directors if I'm going to have a bishop. You know, but as far as Anglican TV is concerned, not a problem. Uh, but Gavin, are you, are you still willing time? Uh, you know, if you have the time to to do the show. Kevin, I, I, this has been such a privilege for me. Uh, at the risk of making a fool of myself, uh, which I'm, I'm so capable of doing. Too late. Do you know what? <laughs> so I, I'd be very grateful for is I've made some wonderful friends through Anglican Unscripted. People, people have written to me um, on the whole nicely, but sometimes creatively, uh, sometimes to, to tell me things that I, I thought I could have had, but didn't. it's been great. This is such a privilege. I'm, I'm really grateful. Uh, and once again, the, the, the point is to bless and strengthen and inform and encourage God's people. Uh, so if there's any chance at all of playing a role in the kingdom and serving our Lord in that way, you know, I'm, I'm just very grateful. And, and as soon as I start boring people or misspeaking more than a certain percent, uh, I, I'll, I, you know, I look forward to the email and I'll hand over to someone better. Well, I, people may not know this, but before each show, we do one thing. We pray. And mm. we pray that we don't come off as fools. We pray that we encourage the church. Um, we pray that we give transparent information. I mean, I was. There's no way we were not going to have Gavin on and talk about uh, uh, the consecration. Um, that's we are who we are. We're honest people. Uh, and but most of all, in our prayer before the show, we pray that uh, when we click done and publish and all that and record, that God is glorified. Uh, yes, amen. You know, and. Th for what other reason is to do this uh, would be some narcissistic uh, event, and we're not into that yet. Uh, we're, we're here to glorify God. And uh, Gavin, I want to thank you for your time and a, a great follow-up to our unscripted, unscripted last week <laughs> and our new yes. unscripted in the future. I'm Kevin Carlson. Uh, I'm Gavin Ashton, and this has been episode 328. 
Thank you for listening.